everyone and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Justice Committee in 2020. And we have apologies this morning from Liam MacArthur, MSP. Our first item of business is to continue stage one consideration of the defamation and malicious publication Scotland Bill. And I welcome our panel of witnesses who are all attending uh, online uh, this morning. Welcome to you all. Uh, Professor John Blackie from the University of Strathclyde, uh, Christopher Brookmeyer, uh, an author, and Campbell Dean from Bannatyne, Kirkwood, France and Co. Um, I'd like very much to thank the witnesses for their um, extremely helpful written submissions, which are as always available uh, to the public on the committee's web pages. And I invite the um, panel first to make some short opening remarks, and then we'll move uh, to questions. So, uh, Professor Blackie, uh, would you like uh, to start with any opening remarks? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for um, having me to speak to you but also that Elspeth Reed, professor at Edinburgh University, would have been with me today, and a great deal of our work is joint, uh, but she's unfortunately away on holiday. So it's me alone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So um, my opening remarks are uh, that this is an issue which the whole bill involves both policy questions, which of course are not for me, but also some technical questions. And so our paper, in fact, attempts to address some of these technical questions. Uh, and at certain points, we suggest actual drafting of the bill if our submissions are accepted. So we cover the question of the serious harm threshold. Uh, we cover uh, the question of whether there should be a statutory definition of defamation. Uh, and also we deal with malicious publications with the defense of truth. I'm not sure if it's just me or if it's for everybody that Professor Blackie has frozen. But while the technical wizards behind the scenes sort all of that out, and I thank them very much uh, for their work, perhaps we can move to uh, Campbell Dean. Um, uh, Mr. Dean, do you have any opening remarks before we launch into uh, questions? Yes, I'd like to, to, to thank the committee in the first instance for the opportunity to, to address you on this topic. I'm delighted that um, my uh, fellow witnesses include such um, knowledgeable figures as Professor Blackie and actually my favourite Scottish crime noir author at present, Christopher Brookmeyer. Unfortunately, I suspect that uh, Christopher's views will differ from mine in relation to this book, and hopefully I won't appear in any of his forthcoming novels. Um, I'm approaching this as a practitioner who for 25 plus years every day uh, advises a large part of the Scottish print media um, in relation to both pre- and post-publication defamation issues. And one of my, my quandaries is that the, the bill, while on the one hand may in fact benefit them, um, and whilst a huge advocate of the, of the principle of freedom of expression, when one puts the pursuer's hat on, um, I, I feel that there is an imbalance on the bill, and um, particularly in relation to serious harm, which I suspect we'll cover as, as the, 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 the matters progress. Um, but in short, I think there is an imbalance, and I also consider that we, we, we've been, I'm sure the committee's been hearing phrases like thin skin and thick pockets when it comes to um, trying to stop publication of um, various stories. That is not something which I'm personally aware of, having acted for as I say, a considerable period of time on a daily basis. And I, my, my own view is that that hand may have been yeah. overplayed. Okay, that's very okay. helpful. Thank you. We certainly will come to a number of those issues uh, in, in questioning. But before we do that, perhaps I can bring uh, Christopher Brookmeyer in for any opening remarks that he may wish to make. Hey, I Really, just all I've got to say is to thank the committee for inviting me, and I'm here as much um, to learn and absorb as to contribute, because obviously the legal side of things is far from my area of expertise. I primarily deal in lies. 
Um, oh, that, that, that's tremendous. That, look, thank you very much. We're going we're to go straight into questions. We've got about an hour and a quarter, and I'll just focus the first questions on Mr. Dean and uh, Mr. Brookmeyer while we are trying to resolve the issues with uh, Professor Blackie's uh, connection. So first, if I can turn to Mr. Dean, um, and I just wonder if you can explain for the benefit of um, the, the committee, uh, Mr. Dean, how Scots law currently uh, operates to protect uh, privacy. Uh, and in particular, to explain what role defamation might have to play in the protection of privacy within within Scots law. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, the privacy arguments are slightly different from the arguments in relation to defamation. Privacy involves the the the, the privacy arguments are slightly different from the arguments in relation to defamation. Privacy involves the the. the Although a similar, a similar article it involves whether an individual has a reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, there is very little Scottish case law in relation to that particular topic. Um, and we, in a similar way as we do with defamation, we tend to head down south and cherry pick the, um, the law in England as being um, compatible with the law in Scotland because it flows from the ECHR and therefore the convention rights are, are in theory applicable across the board. Um, the, the position in relation to how we would um, look at whether something is defamatory in Scotland really comes down to the classic sim stretch test as reasonable ordinary reader and whether or not um, what has been said is likely to lower an individual in the estimation of right-minded thinking people. Privacy doesn't really work on that basis, um, predominantly because once the cat's out the bag in relation to privacy and it's been published, well, the, the privacy has, for all intents and purposes, flown off at that particular point. Okay. Um, you said in your opening remarks that you thought that um, uh, the bill represented something of an imbalance, but you didn't specify what the imbalance was. Do I take it that you, do I take it, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please correct me if I'm wrong to in, in, impute this, but do, do I take it from that that you think that the bill shifts the balance too far in favour of freedom of expression at the expense of protection of the right to privacy? I do, I mean, and again, I find that quite a difficult position to adopt, having acted or continuing to act for newspapers for 25 plus years where you're when I'm thinking to myself, hold on a minute, um, let's let's roll back back in the freedom of expression. It just doesn't sit right. However, I, that that is the view that I form here. I, I, I when when the bill originally came out, I wrote a, a, an article on it, and I, I think that article was headed "What's in it for the pursuer?" And the answer is nothing. There the, there is nothing in here which assists a pursuer in relation to to litigation. Uh, that's not a call to race to litigate in relation to defamation, but it seems that there are now hurdles after hurdles being put in play, which I personally think achieve very, very little, apart from potentially increasing expense. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Can I ask Mr. Brookmeyer whether in his uh, professional career as an author uh, he has um, had any encounters um, with the law of defamation? Is it something... Mr. Brookmeyer, that you think about at all um, when you are writing or when you are publishing? Is there, has there been any um, direct or indirect chilling effect, for example, on, um, on on your freedom of expression as a as a published author? It's difficult, really, um, to sort of retrospectively assess the extent to which one self censors because of a potential. Um, I mean, I, I started off 25 years ago writing more overtly satirical fiction in which there were often quite grotesque parodies of, of if not identifiable public figures, but certainly identifiable behaviour and attitudes. Um, and I think I would always at that point have felt that I was protected by um, the law of fiction, the, the fact that um, these were often amalgams of individuals. But I am conscious at times that I might be um, that there's a danger that someone might identify themselves too closely with with a, a fictional depiction, uh, and it 
it's, it's perhaps just something that I'm um, conscious of myself. I don't want to be uh, causing a problem for my publisher. Uh, I don't want my book to get bogged down in, in uh, litigation in any way. But I can't point to many concrete examples of, of works of fiction that have fallen foul of this. I think you know, so one's own uh, concern um, is, is maybe not always rationally based. Uh, I'd have to admit that. But I am conscious at times that I am uh, changing things or, or holding back with, with, at times because I'm concerned that if often if you're writing about, um, in my case, the, the figures that have most um, bothered me might be litigious figures, might be people who would be likely to object to a particularly grotesque depiction um, of their attitudes that they, they might wish to identify themselves with. So um, it's it's hard to gauge the extent to which um, I could argue there's any chilling effect on my work that is born of more than my own uh, natural cautiousness with regard to this. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you. You mentioned your um, your, your publishers. Uh, have your have your I might be about to ask you a question which you can't answer. I don't know. Um, but have your publishers ever put any pressure on you um, uh, to um, increase your consciousness of their likely liability should uh, should you inadvertently defame somebody in your work, or do you feel, on the contrary, that you are really quite well supported um, uh, uh, by? I, I have been very well supported by my publishers in, in terms of um, some of the creative decisions that I've made, uh, but I have on occasion uh, had notes, editorial notes, saying, "Can you change this because we might be laying ourselves open." Um, and there's times when I've thought that was uh, a ridiculous concern because it was often too grotesque or or, uh, or something that was clearly meant as a joke. But um, I noticed it more and more in recent years that um, I would get editorial notes saying, "Can you change this so that it's not too obviously identifiable with a particular individual or even a particular institution or a, a, a company?" Um, I've had to go through and change the names of. of Fictional companies because they just um, sounded a bit too much like an existing company uh, or an existing organisation, even if it wasn't a a, a, a company or an organisation that's in the same field. It's just that the publishers certainly seem um, wary of, of perhaps even um, mischievous litigation or opportunistic litigation. I don't know. They're, 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 um, I, I defer to their paranoia over my own because they're going to be uh, the, the, the ones who get more experience and they're the ones who are talking to lawyers about what may or may not be uh, actionable. But I, I'm, I, I'm conscious that it, it might even come down to individual editors or, or you know, that, that sometimes you'll get a lot of editorial notes saying, Please be wary of this, or can you change this character's name because it, the name sounds too much like someone else? I had to change the name of a major character in a novel, Fallen Angel, because the the name just sounded a bit too much like a, a real person. And given the crimes the character was going to be depicted as committing, uh, obviously we didn't want to claim that there was any overlap here. And the person did work in the same field, which was going to make it more. Um, uh, Jeopardy, I put myself more in jeopardy of uh, an accusation that I had intended a comparison with this real person. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and bring um, Professor Blackie back in, in in one second, and then after that, it'll be Annabel uh, Ewing to pick up the questioning. But can I just say, please, to all members and witnesses, please don't try and control your microphones or cameras. Um, that is uncentrally. Please do not try and touch your microphones or uh, cameras. Thank you. That, that would be very helpful. Thank you. But Professor Blackie, I don't know if you were able to hear what Campbell yes, Dean said. Can, uh, yeah. can you hear me? Uh, if you did hear it, could you um, perhaps respond? Do you think that the um, uh, the bill threatens to uh, undermine the way in which Scots law protects privacy or reputation? Um, I think they're different questions. Can you hear me? Yes, please carry on. Yes, I think they're different questions. Privacy is a question of um, interference with private life. Now, the modern law is, of course, they're derived from 
uh, Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, England didn't, in fact, have a privacy law until it became influenced by that. Arguably, we did. But that's about interfering into the personal sphere of somebody. Whereas I think defamation today is not about that. Defamation is about reputation and uh, the consequent impact on a person where uh, reputation is affected. Uh, it would have been possible to reconfigure the whole law, I suppose, so that privacy and defamation were dealt in the same legislation, but I think that's not what we're doing, and nor do I think it's appropriate just now. Okay, th thanks. I'm going to um, turn uh, the questioning over to a Annabel Ewing, who I think wants to pick up on a number of these themes. So, Annabel, over to you, please. Thank you, uh, convener. Good morning to our witnesses. Um, if I could ask Mr. Dean, firstly, um, you fairly unequivocally, it has to be said, have concluded that the bill as it currently stands does not, in your view, strike the right balance as between freedom of expression and um, the right of protection of reputation. So, as far as key elements of the bill are concerned, what, what do you think would need to be amended to bring that balance into play? Well, the, the main issue, as I perceive it, is the question of serious harm, um, because I I believe that when you introduce that extra barrier, you're putting a hurdle in the way of a litigant who may well have a perfectly good right of action, but you're you're forcing them to prove, and it will be for them to prove ultimately, as far as I can see here, that they have been seriously harmed by the event. Now, in a personal injury action, for example, you wouldn't turn around to somebody who was involved in a road traffic accident and say, well, you only broke your leg, you didn't have to get it amputated, therefore we're not going to give you any damages. Um, why should somebody who has been defamed not have the, the ability to go to court and say, my reputation has been damaged, I have suffered harm, why should I have to prove that that harm is serious? That, that will involve cost. There's no doubt about that. It'll involve cost on both sides um, to prove that or to defend the position that it is not serious harm. And that's where I think that the, the balance primarily falls down in relation to this legislation or draft bill. There has been nothing, um, I'll rephrase that, nobody has said to me or been able to explain to me how freedom of expression will be improved by the introduction of serious harm. If anything, it is arguable that journalists will take a, a, a slightly less responsible attitude and not qualify for what would have been the previous Reynolds privilege defense of, of responsible journalism, because they can work on the premise that, well, this isn't going to seriously harm them, we'll just take a, a nibble at them and, and cause some damage. So that, that's what, that, that's the, the issue which I concerns me most. Okay, um, I, it's very clear um, expose of what you see is the key element of the bill that would merit uh, being looked at, uh, certainly from the pursuer's point of view. Can I ask Mr. Brookmeyer? Um, I was very interested to hear his comments to uh, his answer to the previous question from the convener. And I just wonder, in his view, accepting, you know, he's he's not, Mr. Brookmeyer is not a lawyer, but from his position as a writer, does he have a, a great expectation that actually the bill, even if enacted in its current form, would have any particular impact on the way that he approaches his writing? And does he have any expectation that his publisher would be any less cautious in terms of the um, approach they have taken, as he described thus far. Perhaps Mr. Brookmeyer could comment on that. Um, I'm not convinced that the, the, the bill would have a, a great impact on, on the way I, I write um, because of the, the, the reasons I just outlined. I, I, th I think um, I, I've not been conscious. As a writer of fiction, I think you're, you're less wary 
uh, of the, the danger of, of litigation, um, because it's, it's a, a very different sphere to writing journalism, which purports to be fact, which purports to represent the truth. When you're writing fiction, you're always creating a, a kind of your um, simulacrum of, of modern reality, and, and people interpret it that way. They know that you're not necessarily saying something is true. You're saying this is what I think the world looks like, and I hope that you recognise it. Um, so the, the the finer details, the distinctions, I, I certainly appreciate the reasons why there's a, a need to update the law and to clarify certain things. But those finer distinctions are not going to have a an impact. From my point of view, I can't speak for how my editors would uh, interpret that. But I think similarly, um, given that most of my editors tend to work in London uh, publishing, the, um, the extent of the attention they'd be paying to this <laughs> would not be vast. And again, it would be more the I think the lawyers at Little Brown, for instance, that publish me would be more concerned uh, with the implications for non-fiction books that they might be publishing, or biographies or, or autobiographies, um, and, and memoirs, etc. So, um, I, I, the, the realm of fiction is, I think, I'd have to admit, quite rarely uh, damaged by by this, because I think that there is often the opportunity to to write characters that are very. Uh, unflattering and people are reluctant for good reason to say, hey, you know that really unflattering depiction? That's me. <laughs> so um, I think generally uh, fiction is a, a, an area that is not going to be massively uh, damaged by this, certainly not in, in my experience. And it's perhaps it's that format. I can understand that perhaps a stage play uh, or a film or, or, or a television program, those fictions might uh, by their nature be be more impacted upon and their producers more wary um, of legal ramifications. But um, fortunately, fiction seems to be comparatively protected. I can't think of an instance of an author being sued over a fictional depiction of an individual. That's very interesting. Thank you for that. And perhaps I could ask Professor Blackie just on the very broad issue. We had some witnesses uh, the other week, I think one from the Faculty of Advocates and a, a lawyer uh, in the field who um, suggested in effect that actually you know, this uh, bill borrows very heavily from the approach taken down south, but we don't have the same issues here in Scotland. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's a solution for a problem that does not really exist in Scotland. Could Professor Blackie comment on that general proposition? Uh, yes, I agree with that, uh, but I'd like to give it a bit more precision as to what we mean about that. Um, the first reason that was given in England in the work that they did in the um, Law Commission of England and Wales for the serious harm requirement was because of um, the fact that it was felt that there were large players who were using this, um, the lack of such a thing, as a way of um, getting too much power. Um, the, however, it was a question also of um, libel tourism then arose. Would they actually come to Scotland if we didn't have it? Now, there's absolutely no sign of that. And we're now, you know, we're seven years away from the English Act. Um, the second thing is um, that there actually was a different background in English law anyway before they introduced that. And this is because in England, there was a distinction between slander and libel. In slander, that's oral defamation. In slander, you actually did have to prove some particular financial loss, whereas in um, other defamations, um, you, you did not. So there was a muddle in their law that they wanted to sort out. Um, there is a muddle that we didn't have. Um, and then uh, there is um, a question of complexity and cost. Now, I think that 
But you have to understand to see this, you have to look at two things. One is, what is that's the reality on the ground in Scotland? And that's what the uh, Bank of Advocates were referring to. If you look at our reported case law, which is, of course, not an absolute guide to all the claims that are being made, most of our claims are by ordinary members of the public, and a high proportion of them are actually not against the media at all. There have been several claims um, in uh, recent years. Uh, for example, there's quite a well-known one uh, where a member of the Scottish women's curling team uh, raised a claim against her coach uh, for defaming her and saying that she had refused to play in a match. Now, this was actually really, um, you know, it, it was not a media thing at all. And there are many, many other examples. So my view is that we don't have the problem here, but there's also a question of the nature of the test for defamation comes into this. If you look at the approach to a number of claims in Scotland, and uh, we've got three of those from uh, since uh, 2007 into our paper, you can see that the Scots courts will not allow claims to proceed or succeed where the evidence is basically that it's banter. So that, um, you know, the test for defamation, which is much more flexible, I think, than sim against stretch cold, if you like, which is in um, section 14A, is that the court will in fact um, apply in a hidden way a, a very un, if something is really very ridiculous, they will will not allow it uh, to succeed or proceed. So in every respect, I think that we we don't need this, and it will almost, I believe, cause extra expense. I had a quick look um, yesterday, in fact, at the uh, reported cases in the English courts. Uh, in last year and this year, where this question was raised. Now, in a very high proportion of them, um, there had to be lengthy proof of fact. Uh, and, uh, and actually, the, the defense had, uh, it was uh, successful that it passed the serious threshold. But this adds a very considerable expense because you cannot readily do it without proof of the facts about the extent to which reputation was harmed. Now, in Scotland, we have always, and we have it generally, an ability to deal with this on the written pleadings without hearing any proof of fact at all. And that, I think, is going to be a problem if you have a serious harm test. It puts up costs. And there seems no point in putting up costs. Finally, I would say our general law of dealing, so that includes um, all legally imposed civil liability, um, does have a principle uh, that um, of de minimis rule, as it's called, that very trivial effects you simply cannot sue for anyway. So. On all those grounds, I think that this is not an appropriate thing to have for us in our context. And um, so, yes, I agree, but those are the specific grounds for agreeing. Thank you very much, Professor Blackie, for that extremely comprehensive answer. If I could just lastly, uh, convener, ask briefly, uh, Mr. Dean, and you know, picking up the general theme of barriers and cost and all the rest of it. Um, there has been quite a bit of discussion in committee when we've been taking evidence on the issue of uh, pre-litigation correspondence, with some taking the view that this should be prohibited uh, and that it, um, it, it, it is intimidatory uh, and so forth, with others taking completely the opposite view. I just wonder if Mr Dean could give his view on that issue. Well, 
I, I don't think you can stop somebody from writing or instructing an agent to write a pre action letter to, to preserve their rights. Um, what I would say is that um, there are, well, actually, there's two separate ways of looking at this. There's the letter that comes into the newspaper, and those letters, as a general rule, are actually quite helpful when you're providing pre publication advice because you can analyze that letter and you can look at it and go, hold on a minute, um, they're making this particular point. We haven't got that button down at all. Let's go and have a think about that. Now, that's responsible journalism. There is the letter which you get, which is just quite frankly couched in such terms that you know nothing is ever going to happen as a consequence of it. Um, but I, I can't see how you can penalise somebody for trying to protect their rights. It just doesn't. It just doesn't sit. The letter that I think causes the most problem is not the one that goes to the newspaper. It's the one that goes to, for example, the individual who's on Facebook, who's posted something, and is told at that particular point, "Unless you remove that, now we're going to sue you." And now that happens, but that is done because. The person who's contacted to write that letter believes that they have a, a genuine grievance. The letter which is issued, which, which is um, ultimately there's no intention of taking anything further forward, and it's just a threat. Well, my own view on that is that I wouldn't issue a letter like that. That just cheapens, as a lawyer, that just cheapens your brand. If you're not prepared to follow that up, then don't write the letter. Um, you, you need the client to confirm at the outset, are you willing to go through with this? Because I don't want to write to someone just to put them on notice for the sake of putting them on notice. Okay, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I speak as a lawyer, I should declare an interest of a member of the Law Society of Scotland, um, but not currently practising. Um, I mean, I, from memory, I, you know, I, I recall that actually there are rules, practice rules about uh, such, in general, such matters about writing. Um, Furious letters, which are you know clearly not based on anything that you feel is going to go anywhere. So maybe that's a different angle into that issue as well. There's certainly no there's certainly no pre-action protocol in Scotland in relation to to, to those types of letters. However, um, any letter that you write or that we write in that situation will always contain a line that's saying go and get separate legal advice on this. Don't don't take our word for it. Go and speak to a lawyer. Um, so they at least have the opportunity to be appraised of, 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 of what the, the, that you're not just pulling the wool over their eyes. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, convener. Thank you, uh, Annabelle. Um, uh, now, Rona, you were going to ask about the serious harm test, but I don't know if you think that that's yeah. already been covered in what we've uh, heard. Just the get a, yeah, just get a, a couple of um, very quick questions because yes, it's been covered quite extensively. Could I just go to um, Mr. Brutmeyer first and um, ask him if um, do you think that you would be better protected um, as an author if a serious harm test was um, was introduced in the bill? Uh, I really don't feel qualified to to answer that. I, I can't um, break down hypotheticals to think that. If, if a law, a law's particulars are difficult for me to comprehend, it's even harder to imagine that that's going to have much of an impact on how I practice my fiction. Okay, thank you. That's fine. I could ask, um, Mr. Uh, Professor Blackie, please. Um, do you can you see scenarios where someone might not be able to proceed uh, because of the serious harm test, and will that be difficult um, to prove for the pursuer? Uh, yes, I can see examples of that. One of the most obvious ones is that if it's resisted on that basis, then you're going to have to go to the expense of collecting further evidence at an early stage, which great cost, and then you're going to be faced very possibly, particularly if it's a powerful player on the other side, a well-funded player, uh, that um, is going to cost money. And that seems to me to be the first problem. The second thing really goes to this, is that the in Scotland, where 
many of the cases, as I say, are not against the media and they are small things. And with the Internet, this is increasing. What people are really wanting to do is vindicate their reputation. It's not about the money. It's therefore not about that. It's, it's you know, to vindicate the reputation. So I think it will really present very considerable barriers which are unnecessary and cause expense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dina, I, I take it you um, you agree with that from what you, you said before. Um, you, do you think that there will be people who will not be able to proceed because of this threshold? I think the point that Professor Blackie makes is in relation to not about the money is actually incredibly well placed. The, you tend to find when you're issuing pre-action correspondence, you ask for various things. You ask for it to be removed. You ask for an undertaking not to do that again. You sometimes ask for their proposals in relation to payment of legal costs, something like something along those lines. The vast majority of people, if the article or the, the statement is is then removed, that's it. That's all they want. They simply want rid of it. Um, yeah. so, uh, can see a situation where um, the, the cost element of it can can get out of hand. If you um, had to, well, I suppose one example would be the the recent Campbell and Dugdale case. Now, the the issue there would be would um, Kezia Dugdale have succeeded in relation to serious harm in saying if that was now in play, and I. Uh, when you look at the at Sheriff Ross's determination before it went to the inner house before Lord Carloway, and that uh, Sheriff Ross granted uh, Stuart Campbell in the event that he had succeeded damages of one hundred pounds. Now that could not be serious harm. That just it couldn't be. But to get to that stage of arguing that his reputation had not been damaged or only damaged to that extent would have involved at least two days of proof. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. Uh, thank you. Thanks, convener. Uh, thank you, Rona. We'll come back to you uh, in a minute. But uh, I'm going to turn now to uh, John Finney, please, uh, who wants to ask some questions about the Derbyshire principle. John. Thank you very much indeed, uh, convener, and good morning, panel. Yes, uh, it, Section 2 of the Bill creates a, a statutory version. Because the principle of public authorities in general terms not being able to sue for defamation. I'd like to put a question first to Professor Blackie and then to, to, to Mr. Dean. And Professor Blackie, you, you allude to this in your evidence, um, and you suggest a different approach, and you indeed very helpfully offer a, a form of words. Can you speak about that section of your evidence? Yes. Um, the Derbyshire principle is. Um, one which is um, a good one. So there's no way in which I'm, I or Professor Reed with me would, would, would object to it. But it's important, I think, to understand what underpins it, first of all. What underpins it is that where it is appropriate that political debate takes place and not the use of the courts, then that is the Derbyshire principle guiding principle. So that in Derbyshire itself, the county council, it is appropriate if you disagree with council's decisions, any of that sort of things, or council's um, uh, behavior, then as an institution, that is for politics. And politics should be unfettered in argument and there should therefore not be defamation action. So the question then becomes um, what public authorities should be uh, able to rely on this. But the guiding principle should all the time be that one of where should things be left to politics. And so that is what I've attempted to do in our written submission. Uh, we consider that the the section as it currently is is actually extremely difficult to read and i think results in a number of 
uh, things potentially being unclear, and it's the boundaries that matter. So asking that question, I've then uh, gone on to deal with a number of classic issues, um, one of which is actually uh, state schools, because in England the law on that is unclear, um, uh, and universities, charities, public utilities, businesses owned by public authorities. So that's um, what I think we're trying to do, is give clarity. And it is not, I think, satisfactory to leave the clarity to just the ministers doing things by regulations, which could result with the best will in the world with just an enormous list and not getting the principle behind it. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Professor Blackie. That is indeed helpful. Um, uh, Mr. Dean, if I turn to you, please, you, you also um, allude to problems with drafting, and particularly Section 2.5 and the issue of personal capacity. I wonder if you could speak a bit about that, please. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think everyone understands the general principles, the Derbyshire principles. Um, it's one of the things that you get taught right at the outset in relation to um, giving advice in respect of defamation. But my concern, I suppose, is that we may, we may be trying to actually legislate ourselves into difficulty here. And that's probably the just the need of some refinement in respect of the drafting more than anything else. Um, the section um, 2 5, for example, um, tries to separate the um, the public from the private. But I, I mean, I, I, I struggle with the language in Section 2.5, really, because I, can, I can't quite fathom where it goes and what the, I understand what the purpose or what they're trying, what's being tried to be achieved in the drafting. But the problem is that where the private veers into the public or the public veers into the private, where do you draw the line? Um, that, 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 that's really my concern with that. So if you're acting in relation to uh, a politician who does something in his private life which affects his political position, is that personal capacity or is that political capacity? And I, Can I, I, ask, I sorry. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted there. Can I ask, do you believe then this is clouding something that's clear at the moment? Um, I don't know how clear it is at the moment in the sense of there's very little, there's, there's, but I'm not aware of any litigation which has arisen where the issue of Derbyshire principles in, in recent times has, has come up so that you could, you could say, well, this is, this, we don't know where we are with this. Well, I, what I would say is that the principle itself is, is very straightforward. The difficulty starts when you look at private companies being part of public bodies or personal capacity and private capacity. Uh, it may well, be the, there probably are two solutions to it. You either leave it alone, um, and you, cause, because people understand the general premise, or you refine the drafting to get it into such a way that it, is, it becomes very clear what is being, is being, uh, trying to be achieved. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, t t turning to Mr. Brookmeyer and noting that you've said on more than one occasion, Mr. Brookmeyer, that you're not a lawyer, I, I wonder, would you comment in general terms about this? This is the principle of public authorities not being able to, to sue. And if I could move on to a further question, which I'll come back to the other two um, gentlemen on. Scottish Pen proposed that only companies with fewer than 10 employees, the so-called Australian model, should be able to sue for defamation. I wonder if you have views on that, please. Um, as, as a writer of fiction, I would always reserve the, the freedom to be able to give my impressions of how an institution, an authority, a company is conducting themselves. Um, and within the, the, the realm of fiction, you're sometimes creating a a, a parody of that, a, a grotesque exaggeration of that, because sometimes it's necessary to blow up the um, the unpalatable aspects in order to draw attention to them. 
So necessarily you're going to create a, a depiction that's particularly unflattering if you're wanting to draw attention to something that you think is wrong. Um, I, just as a layperson, and that, could be I, a, and that could be of a public authority as well. Yeah, I was going to say, as a layperson, I don't see that a public authority should um, be able to uh, have resource to defamation law uh, to remedy that. You know, I, I, I think. Um, to me, it goes back to the whole, the, the whole principle of corporation, any kind of body being allowed to be treated as an individual. You know, I, I think um, much wrong has come of, of, of that principle, uh, and I, I think it's, it's slightly cowardly as well. You know, to be able to, to say, well, we as an organisation are being uh, defamed by your depiction. I think uh, individual behaviour. Or, um, should be accountable, and um, corporate behaviour should be accountable. But it should be accountable on the basis of the behaviour of individuals collectively. So uh, my instinct, from uh, a position admittedly of, of legal ignorance, is, is um, to be uncomfortable with the idea of a, a local authority, for instance, a public body, uh, having recourse to uh, defamation proceedings as a means of deflecting criticism. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I wonder first to uh, Professor Blackie, um, do you have a view on uh, the submission that it action should only open to organisations with fewer than ten employees, the so-called Australian model, Professor? Um, I think that's inappropriate. Um, I think first of all that uh, the this is to take a sledgehammer to crack a nut that actually doesn't exist in Scotland. Um, the background to that was, I think, the famous case where McDonald's pursued in England um, a couple of um, people who um, basically ran a campaign against McDonald's. But ten employees is not a big business. You know, it's not even a medium-sized business in Scottish terms. The Scottish economy has an enormous number of businesses that would have a number of employees of, of that kind of size. Um, also, there's a control on business defamation. They have to prove financial loss, or at least in the broad sense not specifically how much they've lost. So it's not like an individual, and therefore I think that really this is 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 inappropriate for our context. I should also point out that it's not something that the Scottish Law Commission raised in their work and um is not um, you no know, has not been researched. We would need well, right we appear to have Lost Professor Blackie again. I wonder, could I, I turn to, to Mr. Dean for a comment on that so-called Australian model, please? Yeah, well, I, I share similar views to Professor Blackie in relation to that. And, and the point that I was going to make, and he just picks up on um, before he was cast off, which is that um, loss is not easy to establish as a corporate body. Um, I was involved in a case maybe five, six years ago. Uh, the course of the session, but it was it was spectacularly difficult to show going through company accounts, getting auditors in to try and show any loss whatsoever, and that is the kind of level that you need. In the, in the very recent case um, involving Andy Whiteman, MSP, um, he, uh, it was raised by uh, the Wildcat Haven uh, Community Interest Company, and that they ultimately one of the reasons that they failed. Or one of the many reasons that they failed, rather, was that they had no corporate loss whatsoever. They couldn't prove it. Corporate loss is not an easy thing to prove. And obviously, not having feelings like an individual, that's the only thing they can sue for. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, convener. Th th thanks, John. I, I wonder if I could just um, ask um, Mr. Dean one follow-up question about the scope of the Derbyshire principle and the way in which that principle is legislated for in uh, Section 2 of the Bill. And Mr. Professor Blackie said um, that he thought that the principle that underpinned the Derbyshire rule um, was to uh, insulate the political process, the democratic process, from 
um, uh, any kind of threat of um, a defamation action um, being raised by somebody who is elected. And I wonder if Mr. Dean agreed with that, or uh, is the principle uh, to protect the provision of public services more generally, irrespective of who actually provides them uh, from uh, the law of defamation? Because depending on what you thought the Derbyshire rule was trying to achieve, that would determine uh, how you thought um, uh, that uh, Section 2 might um, uh, might be in, amended and, and improved. Mr. Dean. I think it's the former. I think it's, it is the political sphere is to stop people doing that. The difficulty arises where and I suspect it's not a difficulty now where the where the individual who's part of that organization is funded by that organization to raise defamation proceedings. So if you are um, a local authority and your chief executive is defamed by the paper or by, by a, third, a third party and the local authority turns around and says, well, we'll fund this for you. Don't worry. That's that that becomes an abusive process because you're, the individual is. Um, is, is having his funded, funding being paid to get round the Derbyshire principle. That, that, that's very helpful. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to bring in Rona Mackay uh, next. Then after Rona Mackay, it will be James Kelly, please. Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, I'd like to um, talk a bit about um, secondary publishing and then go on to the wider issue of online behaviour. Um, could I come first, please, to Mr. Dean? Um, Mr. Dean, I, I was slightly alarmed as a former sub-editor to see in your submission that um, you suggest that a sub-editor could be liable for content. Um, I'm a bit confused about all of this. I mean, is it the publisher, is it the author, or the editor that would that would be liable? I wonder if you could possibly um, clear that up a bit, please. Going a little bit too far in my my, in my submission on that, but the, the, if, an editor, if an editor tinkers with a statement, for example, as sub editors are known to occasionally do, um, they are creating that statement. They become, for all intents and purposes, um, a, 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 an author or, or an editor in that situation, and therefore they become. I suspect that actually is the law as it presently stands. Um, when I say I've overstated, that that's what what I mean by that, that. So I think that there's a there's an argument that if you wanted to go against the author editor or somebody who is a, a sub editor from from changing a piece of copy just now, you probably could. Again, I suspect the reality is it's quite unlikely. Um, you would have to be a rather vindictive individual to go against some, yeah. were, as opposed to going against the the, the title itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Black. Uh, Professor Blackie, do you have a, an opinion on that? Well, I, I think I, I agree with Mr. Dean that um, the law is as he he says it just now. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be always a problem with secondary publishing because, of course, if you take the simple thing, not not our example here, take the simple thing. Where somebody puts something out online and then somebody else picks it up and puts it out online again, then that's the background to the question of secondary publishing. Um, I didn't, in fact, uh, nodded uh, with Elspeth Reed. We didn't make any comments on this, uh, so it's not something I, I studied the law in very great depth. But I think that it's not just about the media, and so the fine tuning of it may present the kind of difficulty that you're seeing. It seems to be most unlikely, by the way, that the sub editor would be sued as an individual. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry, can I just go back to Mr. Dean, please, and just ask um, from interest? Um, do, do you currently target any secondary publishers um, when you're acting for pursuers? Is that something you've had to do? No, I haven't as a general rule. Um, though what I would say is that particularly in relation to um, when clients contact you because something has been published online and then the ripple effect takes place whereby others pick it up and it goes down the chain. Um, the, the sad reality is that the first question that one would have to ask the client is, 
which one of them has any money. And that's that's just the, the, the economic realities of litigation, because um, if they want to litigate and to fund a defamation action, great, let's let's go ahead and do it. But you're going to get a pyrrhic victory if there's no money at the end of the day to pay for, for costs. So I can see where it is in the interest to try to cherry pick down the line. And therefore, I can see why that particular piece of drafting is, is helpful, because it stops that taking place. OK, well, that's interesting. Can I ask um, Mr. Brookmeyer, please, um, can I ask you about your opinion whether bookshops, um, you know, real bookshops or, or virtual, should they be protected from liability for defamation um, for reproducing content? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think in a, a world where the likes of Facebook and Twitter are seem to be exempt from responsibility for what's published on their platforms, um, the sheer volume, as we, we probably all saw many pieces a couple of weeks ago about how there was 600 books published in one day um, quite recently, the, the idea that bookshops should responsibility for even having sufficient knowledge of what they are putting for sale uh, is, is just completely impractical. It's, it's, it's an absurd thing to suggest that there should be responsibility on the bookshops. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, can I just widen that now just a little out into the online um, behaviour and, and that aspect? And if I could just ask all of you co coming to um, Professor Blackie first, do you think the um, the bill goes far enough in its its um, a emphasis on online content? Should should there have been more um, emphasis placed on that um, aspect um, than actually is? Yes, I do think it goes far enough. The difficulty, of course, to legislate in this field is that the online world is moving all the time. And the danger would be, if you did anything more detailed just now, that in a year's time even, or certainly in 10 years' time, you're simply dealing with a world that is different. So I think it's wise to be cautious about specific regulations online because of technological development coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dean, what's what's your view of that? I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that it's, it's we are looking at something which is evolving and has evolved very quickly over a very short period of time. Um, different platforms are arising, um, different video platforms are having all sorts of, of, of um, uh, types of, of social media, um, I, I think it's difficult to do otherwise. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rona. Um, uh, James Kelly has been waiting very patiently to ask questions about the defences that are provided for uh, in the bill. James. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, could I put a question to Mr. Dean? Um, in recent weeks, we've had different opinions offered from different panels on the offer to make amends uh, procedure. And that has been changed in the bill. And some have maintained that it still allows a fair offer to make amends. Um, and others have put forward the point of view that it potentially undermines that process. Can I ask what your view on it is? Well, my understanding was that the offer of amends procedure is still in play. However, as drafted, I don't think that it automatically provides um, the defender with the opportunity to receive a discount for holding their hands up as early as they possibly can and prior to defences being lodged, so that um, uh, the, the, the level of compensation which they ultimately have to pay would be reduced, and, and that is something which is definitely to be encouraged. The, I mean, even at, at the outset, when the when the initial drafts and, and round tables were taking place with the commission, it was accepted that that the idea of being able to um, end the litigation as quickly as possible is not only for the benefit of the defender, but it's also for the, the benefit of the pursuer, because the pursuer understands there and then that he or she has won. All they are looking for 
is the level of compensation which they are likely to be paid. Now, the wording on the on the, the um, relevant section, I think, potentially allows for the court to take that into account. But under the 1996 Act, there was specific reference to the question of discount, which the fact that the fact that we're having a discussion about does it is a discount available there's a discount not available points to the fact that i think it would just need some form of um, clarity in terms of the drafting to make to either to, to either accept that it does allow for a discount or it doesn't okay so so your position would be that the, the wording's currently vague there seems to be broad agreement that a, a discount uh, should be available as part of this process, and what's really needed is a an amendment to the bill uh, to make the word of clearing and ensure that the, the principle that was previous uh, and it's currently enshrined in the process of a discount pr principle should be maintained. Section two of the ninety six Act was utilised by the media, it, so that's. It, in answer to your question, yes, it's one of the one of the sections of the Act which which media and organisations use. So why, if it is being successful, complicate matters by not using that wording to allow for the same discount? So yes, I would I would thoroughly recommend that the the, the wording or part of the wording involving the discount is reincorporated into the bill. Okay, thanks a lot. That's that's very clear. Thanks, convener. Thank you very uh, much, uh, James. Uh, and uh, Liam Kerr wants to ask some questions about malicious publication, which is a very important part of the bill that we've not yet touched on. Liam. Yes, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, so, turning panel two, part two of the draft bill uh, on malicious publication, I'll direct my first question directly to Professor Blackie. Uh, though, Mr. Dean, you may wish to follow up with Mr. Uh, Professor Blackie's answer. Professor Blackie, in your submission, you raised issues around the threshold for malice. Uh, now, under malicious publication, the pursuer must show a statement is false and malicious. But a statement is then defined, it is categorized as malicious if, inter alia, the pursuer shows that the defender was indifferent as to the truth of the imputation. So, Professor Blackie, does this suggest that a pursuer could win in a case of malicious publication without actually showing malice, as we would understand it. And if that's right, isn't this a significant lowering of the threshold? Um, there is a great deal of difficulty in dealing and using the word malice anywhere in the law of civil liability. And uh, you have to decide what it is that you are really wanting to get at here. Now, remember, this is not defamation. So the question is not answered by simply saying malice. Just to give an example from elsewhere in the law of delict, there are, are, are many areas in the law of delict where malice is used and in different senses. But one perhaps is quite topical in the media in the last week has been the um, arising out of the Rangers case, the uh, malicious prosecution. Now, there in that context, um, it's about motive, and it's also, though, qualified with um, without probable cause. So the question is, therefore, what are you trying to hit here with malice? And there is a danger of the threshold here being too low and being therefore over inclusive. Now, before, at currently in the uh, current law, um, malice is really traditionally related to motivation. Knowledge of the falsity or recklessness as to veracity are indicators of that motivation, but typically along with other factors. Whereas this bill 
makes those indicators simply a threshold level to be crossed where only one of these alternatives is present. And that uh, seems to us to be problematic because it doesn't actually get at what you're really trying to do here. I'd like to say too that um, you, you, it's important to understand that most malicious falsehood cases are really business to business cases. <clears throat> they therefore fall into an area where the civil law does police business behavior. Um, there are other things, for example, like um, inducing breach of contract. So if, you, if somebody is in a business relationship with another in contract and you, you try and get them to um, breach that contract and others are conspiracy to do down a business. So we're in that world in practice mostly here. And the question is, of course, you can't have intention can never be the liability for business to business delict because we've got market competition. So what are we trying to do here? Um, we're not wanting to penalize negligence. So if you have something that says knew it was false or was indifferent to the truth, um, either that or that it was motivated by malicious intention to cause financial loss, circular anyway. So I think that there's a danger here that you run in and say, oh, you were negligent uh, about whether you were going to cause business loss. And um, it's difficult to require, make it as a minimum threshold in deference to police that boundary with falling into negligence. Um, in our paper, we've suggested that it would be better to follow the um, American formulation here. Uh, the US restatement second of torts, so I should explain the background to that. Um, in the United States, where there are 50 odd jurisdictions and federal jurisdiction, um, there is an ongoing program always where it's sought to restate, in other words, to from that enormous volume of differing material, reasonable rule. And if you look at um, that, it's actually paragraph 623A in the restatement, it gives liability for publication of injurious falsehood. Well, uh, that is what we're talking about here. It's different heading. And it says one who publishes a small false statement harmful to the interests of another is subject to liability for pecuniary loss if, and then it gives two conditions. The first is he intends, sorry about the he, but um, he, she, it, intends for publication of the statement to result in a harm to the interests of others having pecuniary value or should recognize that it is likely to do so and that he knows that statement is false or acts in reckless disregard of its truth or falsity. Now you'll see there's no reference there to indifference and indifference is certainly not the threshold. That would mean that, that this would be also properly aligned with the other bits of delict that do arise in business to business um, things uh, I, as, as it's well of competition law. So, so it's that it seems to be a very small, it says only one of these will do either, is the word, that he knew it was false or was indifferent, or that the publication was motivated. So um, it, it's 
that's the difficulty. It's too low a threshold for what uh, this is trying to be. I'm very grateful, Professor Blackie. That was extremely comprehensive and uh, very clear. So I'll move on rather than asking Mr. Dean uh, to come in, although perhaps, Mr. Dean, if, you, uh, if there's anything you want to pick up, uh, do so in the next question. Uh, I shall direct the next question directly to Mr. Dean, uh, but obviously two other gentlemen come in if, uh, if you wish. Uh, given what you've just heard, Mr. Dean, there is no serious harm test in the malicious publication area. Now, it might be argued that that's because business has a, a greater burden to show that words cause loss are, are false and are made maliciously. So if I'm right on that, does that comfort you that serious harm as a test is not necessary here, perhaps because, as you said earlier, it is uh, financial loss is, is difficult to show, or is that higher burden that I've just suggested actually a chimera insofar as the threshold for showing malice, as described by Professor Blackie, is particularly low? Mr. Dean. I think it probably comes as no particular surprise to you that the, the absence of the, the reference, from my perspective, the absence of the reference of serious harm in relation to the business dealings um, is perhaps the, 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 the solution to that is to lose the reference to the serious harm in relation to the earlier part of the legislation. Um, uh, that, that, that is, in a nutshell, the way that I would look at it. Um, you do have a different position. And, and there is a possibility that, um, and I'm sure Professor Blackie will be much better aligned to consider this than I in relation to the, 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 that particular issue, but there is the possibility that um, you would sue almost certainly based on the lower threshold, based on the malicious publication part of it, rather than go for the defamation part to get around the serious harm. Um, so as long as you fit into the correct category, and as long as you're, the circumstances in which you were, in, were, were, were looking at whether you could raise litigation in this, that type of case, as long as it fits into um, the, the part two of the malicious statements where you don't have to show serious, why would you go for the difficulty of raising proceedings, which means that you have to show serious? It just, it just wouldn't work. I think that's a very important point, um, and I'm going to put something similar to Mr. Brookmeyer uh, in two seconds. Uh, before I do, Professor Blackie, uh, I th think Mr. Dean made an interesting point about serious harm there. Uh, do you take a different view, or uh, are you in concurrence with Mr. Dean? Um, I think there is a danger of exactly what um, he, Mr. Dean has just said occurring. I did notice that there was a case in England in this year where, in fact, that appeared to have happened. Uh, but I think that that danger would be much less if the um, definition of malice, as I outlined, was actually different. I think the danger is much higher with this was indifferent to that is currently there as a threshold, minimum threshold. In other words, the minimum threshold is too low for this. And I don't That's very useful. Yeah. I'm very grateful. Um, I, I have a concern, con convener. I think Mr. Brookmeyer, to whom I wish to direct my last question, may be away temporarily. Uh, can I confirm, convener, is that Indeed. correct? Indeed, Liam, we're going to have, we're going to, have to move on uh, to uh, Fulton and uh, Shona, and if Mr. Brookmeyer reappears, we'll come back to you if we have time. Um, but good. I'm going now to Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to um, focus on the area of Section 30 of the Bill, which allows a court to order a third party, like, like a website, for example, to remove contentious material. Um, and this could happen, you know, obviously, before a court has reached a final decision uh, on whether the material is defamatory or otherwise. Um, can I come to Mr Dean first? Do, do you think that's something that will benefit pursuers? I suspect that's the 
you're, you're, we're, we're in the, the terrain of um, in defamation proceedings. So by its very nature, um, as I read that, that's not a, a question of writing to the court, putting in an application. You, 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 would, you would probably need to be in litigation and the costs which occur, can, can occur or, or run with that particular issue. Um, uh, my apologies, I'm just going to have a look, quick, quick, very quick look at section 30. Um, I think the, the court having the power to remove something will, of course, assist any individual whose main um, intent in relation, in relation to raising the proceedings is to remove that article from online. So they're not looking solely for um, some form of financial recompense as a result of the defamatory statement. So if that's their sole intention, but they will have had to go to the extent of raising proceedings to get to that particular place. You can't raise proceedings um, on the basis of please remove this. They would have to be uh, uh, raised on the basis of this is defamatory, um, it's worth X, please remove it. So it's, I suppose it's, it's ultimately a, be a negotiating tactic. Um, th thanks for that. If I, if I could ask um, uh, Professor Black, uh, do you think that um, Section 30 is proportionate? Uh, do you think it's, uh, it's proportionate for a court to make such an order before the case, the case has been decided? That's your views well, on that. I haven't addressed this particularly in my thinking before today. Uh, it's reasonable, I think, to have an opportunity of something that's an interim order, if you like, in the course of litigation. We see that, for example, in um, ordinary personal injury cases where there can be um, an interim order for damages. So um, it doesn't strike me as a particularly onerous on defenders. You have to be in court. You can't get this before you get there. Most cases do not go there. And I would think that it is uh, sufficiently proportionate um, as the judges would uh, not make such an order lightly. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. And, and finally, um, I, I see Mr. Uh, Brookmeyer is back, and I'm just wondering how he feels about uh, the Section 30 uh, part of the bill, which I know he might have been away at the time, which which allows uh, a court to order a third party to remove contentious material. How, how do you think that? Um, how do you feel about that? And how do you think that might work in the publishing industry and in, in your line of work? Um, certainly, uh, it would cause. Uh, <laughs> Uh, conflict between writers and editors. If, if a writer uh, was told that an editor was removing, say, a section of their book for, for that reason, um, there, there would be a, a great deal of tension between the two of them. But um, in, in, in terms of how it would uh, affect the wider publishing industry, I'm, I'm really not qualified to offer an opinion. OK, thanks for that, and uh, thanks very much, Kinder. Thank you, uh, Fulton. Um, uh, Shona Robson, please. Uh, th thank you, convener. Uh, good, good morning, panel. Um, can I first of all ask about time limits? Um, the, the bill would reduce the time scale for raising court action for defamation from three years to, to one. Uh, can I ask um, Mr. Brookmeyer and then Professor Blackie whether you agree with this change? Um, with regards to time limits, I mean, there's, there's <laughs> partly I'm inclined to think that uh, if someone hasn't uh, had a, a, a demonstrable um, negative impact on them by something that was published, it's as if, if it's taken them three years to notice it, it would be hard to demonstrate that there was any particular harm. Um, so I, I can certainly understand that uh, there, there should be a a window that closes on something like that, but once again, this is not my area of expertise. 
keep uh, Professor Blackie? I think, Shona, we might just have lost Professor Blackie. So can we turn that to Campbell Dean? Yes. Um, Mr. Dean, um, can I ask you, in addition to whether you agree with the change, whether you've dealt with pursuers who wouldn't have been able to raise proceedings uh, had they faced a one-year time limit? Um, so, in relation to the former point, am I in favour or against it? I'm, I'm actually relatively ambivalent, in, unfortunately, in respect of that point. I, I, I can. Christopher, Christopher makes the exact exact point, which is that where you raise proceedings, the longer it takes you to raise those proceedings, the question that gets posed in the court is, why is it taking you three years to do this to protect what you want to preserve your reputation? And that must play against you as a pursuer every single time. So far as um, the journalism and the media are concerned, um, keeping notebooks, for example, for three years as opposed to one year is, is actually neither here nor there, because they have to keep notebooks for actions of privacy up to a period of five years. So that's not going to make any difference to the, um, the newspaper industry. It is incredibly hard, what I would say, when you reach the three-year threshold as a defender to put together all the paperwork that you would have done if that individual had raised proceedings within six weeks or eight weeks or six months. You have people, witnesses may be dead. Um, the journalist may well no longer be in that organization. They may have moved on. Um, the journalist may be dead. They may no longer have their notebooks, um, and you are going to have to put forward a defence to that action. So it is hard, and I can see why, on that basis, the moving forward of it from one year to three years, or from three years to one year, I can see that that there's an incentive for that to be done. Um, in relation to uh, raising proceedings on behalf of an individual after three years or before the three-year period. You sometimes are contacted by people who are on the cusp of the triennium, and they, they will pose the question, can I do this? Um, those are not easy cases to take on, because you, you, you have to try and comply with the triennium. But the difficulty is always that you face that question of, why is it taking you so long? Um, I have been in a situation before of acting for a client in Scotland, um, who was time barred in England, so they missed the one year period in England as a reported decision called Kennedy against Aldington, who then raised proceedings in Scotland only for their Scottish losses. Now he was in quite a, a unique position, Mr. Kennedy, because he did have a substantial connection with Scotland as well. So he he was able to to not forum shop, but he was able to explain to the court the reason why he should raise those proceedings in Scotland. But I've not had that situation in reverse. One of the arguments against the reduction in time limit, you, you may have heard, we, we had evidence that the, what about the cumulative effect if something has been going on over a, a period of time and it's only at a certain stage someone has had enough, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you like, and you know that may um, then you know, remove uh, a lot of that evidence, if it's only reduced to the one you do, you have any well, no, response I can see, to that? I can see some merit in that position. I can see that um, drip, the drip, drip effect finally makes someone crack, and they say, "That's it. I'm, I'm, I want to raise proceedings based on what has taken place." Um, uh, if you're doing that and that's appearing online then it doesn't really matter because you're able to rely upon the continual online publication to, to show to the court that it has been continuously published for that certain period of time. It's a different matter if it's a, a national newspaper who publishes a story and three years later or uh, two years and 364 days later you say, I want to sue on that and it's never been followed up. But if it's a relentless campaign going against somebody who finally has had enough, um, even actually if it's out with the three-year period, you can still, or the first 
um, attack is out with the three-year period, you can still rely upon the other material to form your basis for, 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 the, for the prescription. Okay. Uh, just, just finally, uh, Mr. Dean, while while we've got you, um, the Scottish Pen um, proposals for a new court action to provide protection from unjustified threats of defamation action um, have have gained quite a lot of of interest. Um, do you think this would be useful for defenders in practice? So the, the 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 idea is that you, if you write a if you write a letter to a pre-action letter which but, you don't follow up. A new court action to provide protection from unjustified threats of defamation action, basically a counter. You could counter claim that it's a, an unjustified threat of defamation action um, and essentially you could have a counter claim um, against the, 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 the person. Have you any views on on that in practice? I have a smile on my face. I think that's quite frankly bonkers. Um, I just don't, don't see where that would ever be um, possible to uh, to facilitate. And I also can't see how you would you would you well, you would have to be saying that the person who instructed you to write that letter specifically lied to you in respect of the allegation which they which you send out in your letter. So if someone's saying um, I'm accusing you of X, Y, and Z. That person comes to you, and you write a letter, and it says, "My client has not done X, Y, and Z." Then they've told you that. The, the, uh, the they would you would have to prove that they have entered into a campaign to deceive purely to stop you publishing. Now, responsible journalism, by its very nature, would involve you as the, the publisher in that situation, looking at it and going. Um, that's just nonsense. We've got more than enough proof to prove that. They are they are at it. Publish. By all means, when you publish, reference the fact that they tried to stop you publishing it and, and cause them more damage as a result of that. But not I can't see how a scheme can work with, that would restrict an individual's right to, to send a pre-action correspondence on the basis that, that they could be sued for or countersued for so doing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Sean. Uh, Liam Kerr wanted to come back in um, uh, with a very quick supplementary, and then I'm sorry, but we're really going to have to move on to our next business. Liam. Very grateful, convener. Uh, Mr. Dean, just taking you back to the limitation point, the Law Society felt that one year was too short a period uh, because they say it can take time to discover a, a defamatory statement. Uh, am I right that at the moment the, the limitation uh, has a date of knowledge, so akin to, I guess, a personal injury claim that the limitation starts to run, at least in theory, from the date that you find out about the defamatory statement. And the practical impact, if I'm right, of Section 32 6 is that uh, it, it, the, the limitation starts to run at the date of publication. There is no state of knowledge that uh, can impact that. Am I right? Mm, uh, 32 6, apologies. Um, a thirty-two six four in amending the uh, limitation prescription. Uh, I'm sorry, you've caught me on the hop here. Um, sorry, uh, per perhaps I uh, will pose the question later. I'm conscious of time. Go ahead. Um, I, I think I, I, th I think um, uh, what I would say to uh, all of our witnesses. Thank you, Liam. I think what I would say to all of our witnesses is, is if there are. Uh, further issues arising from this morning's uh, oral questions, which you'd like to um, uh, help the committee with, then please do feel free to uh, to, to write to us with any follow-ups. Um, you've all been extremely generous uh, with your time. I'm sorry that we've had one or two technical difficulties along uh, the way this morning, but all three of you have um, raised with the committee uh, points that we will certainly want to consider um, as we um, uh, continue our, uh, to give this bill. Um, a, a attention. I'm afraid at that point we're going to have to close this section uh, of the uh, proceedings this morning and move on. We've got a very big changeover of witnesses now, and we're still awaiting um, the Cabinet Secretary, whose company we need for our next item of business. So uh, we're going to have a relatively long suspension. We're going to suspend for 10 minutes now to enable a complete changeover of witnesses and the arrival of the Cabinet Secretary. So we will reconvene at 11.54. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, the committee now has to consider um, six statutory instruments, um, uh, three affirmative uh, SSIs, uh, one negative SSI, and then two UK um, statutory instruments. And for the first uh, three of these, the three affirmative SSIs, we're joined uh, by the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, uh, Hamza Youssef. Welcome, Cabinet Sec Secretary, to our meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, Hamza Youssef is accompanied by um, various um, officials from the Scottish Government attending to support the committee um, uh, on the different instruments that we have to uh, consider. So we'll turn, uh, if I may, to the first of the three affirmative instruments that the committee must consider this morning, and that is the International Organisations Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Order. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary and his officials and uh, invite the uh, Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement on this uh, instrument. Mr. Yusuf. Good morning, uh, convener, and since this is the first time I am appearing in front of the committee uh, with you as convener, can I put on record uh, my congratulations to you and welcome you to your role uh, as the convener. This will be the first, I'm sure, of many exchanges, uh, which I look forward to. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, the draft International Organisations, Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Order 2020 it confer, confers various legal immunities and privileges upon the Square Kilometre Array Observatory. In March 2014, the UK Government committed to investing £100 million in the construction of the observatory. That's around 16% of the total construction costs. This was agreed as part of the process to bring the HQ uh, to the UK. Uh, the treaty level agreement, uh, the SKA Observatory Convention, was signed by seven countries in March 2019. This provides the basis for the creation of a new international organisation, the SKA Observatory. So far, the Netherlands, Italy and South Africa have ratified the Convention. Uh, the Convention will enter into force once all three host countries, namely the UK, South Africa and Australia, have also ratified. Uh, the overarching reason for the order is to help the UK fulfil its international obligations. Uh, the order before the committee today fulfil those, fulfils those obligations insofar as they relate to devolved matters in Scotland, equivalent provisions in respect to reserved matters uh, and, uh, and devolved matters in the rest of the UK is being conferred by legislation uh, at Westminster. To the extent that the privileges and immunities relate to devolved matters in Scotland, however, conferral rightly falls to the Scottish Parliament. When respective parliamentary passage is complete, both orders will then go to the uh, Privy Council. Well, the order is limited to the issue of privileges and immunities, if I just say a little bit quickly about the background of the observatory itself, the project is an international effort to build the world's largest radio telescope. Around 100 organisations across 20 countries are participating in the design and the development. World-leading scientists and engineers are working in a system which will require two supercomputers, each more powerful than the best supercomputer currently uh, in the world. The observatory's unprecedented sensitivity will give astronomers insight into the formation and evolution of the first stars, galaxies uh, after the Big Bang, the role of cosmic magnetism, I had to Google it too, uh, the nature of gravity, and possibly even life uh, beyond Earth. In terms of um, the, the issue of, of, of privileges uh, and immunity, to enable the observatory to fulfil its purposes and carry out its functions, certain privileges and immunities must apply. This is standard practice for international organisations, enabling them to function effectively across multiple territories. These are granted primarily on the basis of, and I emphasise this, strict functional need. The conferral of immunities and privileges is effectively a condition of membership. It is necessary, it's necessary to enable the observatory to function as an international organisation in the UK. The specific purpose of this order is therefore to provide immunities and privileges to the observatory, members of staff and designated experts. And again, I emphasise, in the course of official activities in Scotland. That is in order to reflect the equivalent Westminster order in terms of protocol privileges and immunity, which has been agreed at an international level. In terms of the nature of the immunities involved, the order provides that the Director General Members of staff and experts shall have immunity from suit and legal processes in respect of things done or omitted to be done, and again, I emphasise in the course of performance 
of official duties. It is important to emphasise it is not for the official person's benefit, and immunity does not provide carte blanche for officials to ignore the laws and regulations of the host country. The privileges and immunities conferred by the draft order are no greater an extent than those required by the Convention to enable the observatory and specified individuals connected with the observatory effectively. Uh, the immunity can be waived by the Council in the case of the Director General, and they can be waived by the Director General in the case of a member of staff or a designated uh, expert. Representatives of a member of the observatory will also be afforded privileges and immunities from legal processes while performing their official capacity. Uh, this immunity can be waived by the government uh, of that uh, country, of that member. Sorry, uh, this immunity does not apply to a person who is a British citizen or any person who, at the time of taking up his or her function, is a permanent resident of the United Kingdom. Uh, in the particular case of motor vehicle incidents, the observatory itself has no civil or criminal immunity where the vehicle belongs to or is operated on behalf of the observatory. Immunities and privileges are therefore limited that they apply only to official actions and can be waived. They do not give an individual freedom to commit criminal activity. An assault, for example, would be prosecuted in the same way. So, in conclusion, uh, convener, uh, the order will help the UK fulfil its international obligations in respect to Scotland. Uh, as a good global citizen, it is the duty of the government to bring it forward to Parliament. Uh, I hope that is helpful, and of course, I am more than happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much. That is that, that is very helpful uh, in, indeed. Um, one member so far has indicated that um, he wishes to ask a question. I just say that um, all questions, Cabinet Secretary, will be directed to you. But if, of course, you want to bring your officials in at any point, then please feel free to do so. If you think that will be helpful uh, to you or to the committee. Um, but uh, John Finney would like to ask a question. So, John, over to you, please. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Cabinet Secretary, if passed, how many individuals in Scotland will benefit under the international obligations and immunities and privileges, and these privileges being not paying tax and immunity from civil and criminal law? What is the total number now? Thanks to the member uh, for the question. So, um, there is expected to be 100 people working in the UK um, initially, and that could once it gets to capacity, be potentially 200 people uh, working in the UK who would then be offered those privileges and immunity. I couldn't at this stage uh, tell you the number that we would be based in Scotland. Those discussions uh, would, of course, uh, be ongoing. But in terms of the UK, it's expected to initially be 100 people, uh, once up to full capacity, around 200 people. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Sorry if I didn't make my question clear. I meant. Um, in total, because of course, over the period, indeed from the period when you are a young man in the Justice Committee with me, I've raised issues about these. The total number of individuals in Scotland who are immune uh, from paying taxes and are uh, given uh, the immunity from civil and criminal law as a result of this international legislation. What's the total number now, please? Oh, forgive me. I, I, I don't have that uh, to hand. Uh, you'll know that there's a a list of, of, of dozens or, of organisations that are granted mm. similar privileges and immunities, the International Maritime Organisation, the European Police College, European Organisation of Astronomical Research, uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, etc. Et so there are dozens of organisations. Forgive me, I don't have the number of people that affects in Scotland, but of course I'll, I can ask my officials to see if we can get an updated number for you. And of course we could write to the convener uh, and, and to the committee with that detail. Um, th thank you. One further question, Cabinet Secretary, and forgive me if it's contained in the information. Um, would the immunity extend to the premises being inviolate, as I understand the term is, um, or would, for instance, Police Scotland be able to crave a warrant in respect of premises owned and occupied by, or indeed rented by, this organisation, please? No, it's a very good question asked by the member. So, uh, to this order, uh, the observatory shall not allow the premises to be used for any unlawful activity uh, or permit the premises to become a refuge for, from justice for persons who are avoiding arrest or services of legal processes under the law uh, of the United Kingdom or, or indeed against whom an order of extradition uh, or deportation uh, has been issued by the appropriate authorities. Therefore, 
Um, to, to answer your question directly, Police Scotland had reason or cause to enter into the premises because they suspected illegal activity, then there would be nothing uh, stopping them from doing so. Uh, can you just clarify then, is that different from previous um, SIs that have been brought to the committee where I understood that to be the position? Uh, forgive me, I would have to I would have to double check uh, if that was the case in terms of previous uh, SIs uh, or not. Um, but uh, as I say, the, the, the observatory under this order uh, would not allow uh, the, those premises to be used for any unlawful activity. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Camilla. <clears throat> uh, thank you, thank you, John. Annabel uh, Ewing, please. Thank you, Kandira. I Thank you, Kandira. Um, sorry, I, I had lost connection there, so I missed the, the first part of the, the, the exchanges, although um, I have uh, participated in such exchanges in the past with Mr Finney, so I, I, I hope I get the general gist. But can I just clarify with the Cabinet Secretary that the uh, proposition put forward is, in fact, based ultimately on, on the uh, obligations flowing from um, international law, uh, and therefore we are required to um, fulfil our international legal obligations, at least in normal circumstances, not perhaps to get too political about events in the House of Commons yesterday, but we are expected to fulfil our international obligations. And there is much um, interesting legal authority on the, the rationale for the UN Convention on Privileges and Immunities from which all this stems. So is my understanding correct that this SSI before us just reflects, in fact, uh, that position? Thank you. Yes, is, is, is the short answer uh, to your question. Uh, I, I um, give a number of organisations which have previously, uh, that this immunity and privileges order has previously been conferred upon. They're international organisations. Some of them are not for profit um, organisations, but certainly a number of the provisions within the order also uh, touch upon, for example, you know, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, this is a, this is a, a normal process as a good global citizen that we would have to fulfil. Um, and in effect, we're also uh, assisting uh, the UK government here, uh, who have uh, who, who the H quarter will be based, and therefore, for them to be able to ratify the convention, uh, they would have to pass uh, this order, uh, and they can do that in Westminster for reserve matters. Uh, but of course, for devolved matters. Uh, that responsibility falls upon us. But the short answer is yes, uh, that is uh, uh, Ms Ewing's uh, interpretation uh, is, is, is spot on. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Kinvira. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> no other member has indicated that they wish to um, ask a question to the Cabinet Secretary about this order, so I think we can move on to its uh, formal consideration. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comments to make on it. Uh, so I think the motion can now be moved with an opportunity for formal debate uh, if necessary. And the motion is that um, uh, motion 224 and 6 that the Justice Committee recommends that the International Organisation's Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Order 2020 be approved. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Uh, and I invite indications uh, to speak from members, and John Finney has indicated that he would like to uh, speak. John. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Convener, um, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and indeed Ms Ewing for their comments. This is indeed a, quote, normal process. There's lots of things used to be normal that are no longer normal. In relation to this, members will note there's been no consultation, there's been no impact assessments. And as I've said many times in relation to these issues when they've been brought before us, and the numbers must be into the thousands, into the thousands, um, um, this committee should be concerned with the equitable application of Scots law, not the disapplication for any individual or organisation. Um, so I once again oppose this format, this approach, and indeed this particular statute. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, John. I invite the um, Cabinet Secretary to respond and to wind up. Look, I'm, I'm happy to know uh, these uh, long-standing uh, opposition uh, to these orders understand the principle 
by which he does so. Uh, and while I respect him uh, for taking that consistent uh, approach, uh, nonetheless, uh, this is an important order, not just to allow for the exploration uh, of, 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 uh, of space, uh, the universe and galaxies, uh, but actually as a good global citizen to ensure that we confer the immunities and privileges on others as much as we would expect um, uh, others to, to confer upon us uh, in their jurisdiction. So I'm happy to just leave it at that and um, ask, uh, ask members to support the order. Uh, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. So the question is that motion 22416 in the name of Hamza Yusuf be approved. Are we all agreed? Uh, we're not agreed, uh, so there will be a uh, division. There will be a vote on motion 22416, um, and we'll use the chat function on blue jeans in order to vote. Um, so all of those members in favour um, of uh, uh, motion 22416, please vote. Please type Y into the chat function now. Thank you. All those members against, please type N into the chat function now. Thank you. And any member abstaining, please abstain now. Thank you. Uh, the result is um, that I'm going to read out the names of all of those who have voted. Um, those who voted yes are Shona Robeson, Adam Tompkins, Annabel Ewing, James Kelly, Rona Mackay, Liam Kerr, Fulton McGregor. Those who voted no, uh, John Finney. No member abstained. So the result is that the motion is agreed by eight votes to one. The clerks will correct me if I've got any of that wrong. Seven votes to one. I'm so sorry. The motion is agreed by seven votes to one. Um, the clerks have corrected me because I did get that, did get that wrong. Um, I invite the committee to delegate to me uh, the publication of a short factual report on our deliberations uh, on this and indeed on all of the statutory instruments today. And I assure uh, Mr. Finney that his dissent uh, will indeed be recorded. Um, our next item of business um, uh, is consideration of a second affirmative instrument uh, today, which is, which is the Management of Offenders Scotland Act 2019 Consequential Amendments Regulations 2020. And we're still joined um, for this purpose by the Cabinet Secretary uh, and uh, uh, Scottish Government officials, who I welcome uh, to the meeting. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement on this instrument, and then we'll move to questions if there are, are any. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Convener. I, 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 I have a question for yours. Are you wanting me to speak to the Management of Offenders Act regulation? Uh, uh, yes, I think that's where we are. Yes, the Management of Offenders, uh, the Consequential Amendment regulations, please. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Sorry, it was possibly my connection. Um, well, that, I, can, I can be very brief um, on the Management of Offenders uh, Consequential Amendment uh, regulations 2020. Uh, convener. The purpose of the regulation, uh, I, I'm happy to explain and then of course take questions. Part two of the Management of Offenders Act 2019 uh, provided for reforms to the system of general disclosure of convictions under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974. These provisions were supported by all parties uh, through the parliamentary process. The reforms included changing some of the terminology used in the 1974 Act. One of those changes in terminology is to change the term rehabilitated person to protected person. Part two of the Schedule I of the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Scotland Act 1980 it relates to disqualifications from jury service as a result of certain criminal convictions. Currently, the 1980 Act refers to rehabilitated persons for the purposes of the 1974 Act rather than protected persons for the purposes of the 1974 Act. The language simply needs to be changed to reflect the new terminology under the 1974 Act, when Part 2 of the 2019 Act is commenced on the 30th of November. In conclusion, the purpose of these regulations is a consequential change to, amendment, uh, to amend Part 2 of Schedule 1 of the 1980 Act, so that it refers to protected persons rather than rehabilitated persons. 
for the purpose of the 1974 Act. That's simply to maintain consistency. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. And forgive me for any connection issues that may have interrupted uh, that uh, presentation. Uh, no, Kevin, it's actually we're hearing you uh, loud and clear, or at least uh, I am. Uh, thank you very much for that. No member has indicated that they wish to ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary a question about this instrument, so I think we can move uh, straight away to its formal consideration. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comments to make on it. So the motion will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate, as always, if necessary. And the motion is Motion 22518, that the Justice Committee recommends that the Management of Offenders Scotland Act 2019 Consequential Am Amendments Regulations 2020 be approved. Cabinet Secretary to move. Happy to move the motion in my name. Uh, no member has indicated that they wish to speak. So the question is that Motion 22518 in the name of Hamza Yusuf be approved. Are we all agreed? Members are indicating that they are all agreed. And the motion is agreed. Thank you. Um, our next item is consideration of a third um, affirmative instrument, which is the Equality Act 2010 Specification of Public Authorities Scotland Order at 2020. We, are we continue to be joined by the uh, Cabinet Secretary and by uh, Scottish Government uh, officials. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement on the instrument. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Again, I, I can be uh, relatively brief. Earlier this year, the Parliament passed legislation which created the role of a Scottish Biometrics Commissioner, who will have oversight as regards to the acquisition, to the retention, the use and destruction of biometric data, such as fingerprints, DNA and facial images by Police Scotland, the Scottish Police Authority uh, and the Park. I understand that the Parliament anticipated the, anticipates that the recruitment of the Commissioner will be progressed over the coming months, with the successful candidate taking up the appointment hopefully early next year. This order will simply add the Biometrics Commissioner to the list of public authorities specified in Part 3 of Schedule 19 of the Equality Act 2010, which are required to comply with the public sector equality duty under Section 149 of that Act. The order would therefore place a duty on the Commissioner when exercising their functions to have due regard to the need of uh, the need to eliminate discrimination, harassment, victimisation, and any other conduct that is prohibited by or under the 2010 Act, uh, to have regard to the need to advance, to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share irrelevant and protected characteristics, persons who do not share it, and have regard to the need to foster good relations between persons who share irrelevant protected characteristics and persons who do not share it. Uh, some examples of the Commissioner's functions which this duty is expected to apply are uh, the framing of the content of the Code of Practice, which the Commissioner is required to prepare, the reviews undertaken by the Commissioner on how biometric data is managed by the bodies subject to their oversight, and the recommendations the Commissioner may choose uh, to make. Now, I recognise the importance of ensuring the Commissioner, in exercising of their functions, does so with regards to the equality duties. Uh, I consider that this order offers the best approach to ensure that happens, and I'm more than happy as always to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. That's very helpful. No member has indicated that they wish to ask you a question about this um, order, so I think we can move um, directly to its formal consideration. The dele Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comments to make uh, on it. Uh, the motion uh, will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate if we need it. And the motion is. Uh, motion 22573, that the Justice Committee recommends that the Equality Act 2010 Specification of Public Authorities, Scotland Order 2020, be approved. I invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move. I move S5M 22573. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No member has indicated that they wish uh, to speak, so the question is that Motion 22573 in the name of Hamza Yusuf be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed, and the motion is approved. Thank you uh, very much. Um, our next item uh, is consideration of a negative instrument, the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland Practice and Procedure Number no. 2, Amendment Rules 2020, brackets SSI 2020-246. Uh, 
um, and I refer uh, members to paper four, which is a note on this uh, um, uh, SSI by the clerk. Do members have any comments on this SSI? No member is indicating that they wish to make a comment on this SSI, so are members content not to make any comments uh, to Parliament on this SSI? Members are content not to make any comments on this SSI, and that concludes consideration for this morning, or indeed this afternoon, of the Scottish statutory instruments. Um, so we turn now to the UK statutory instruments, and agenda item nine is consideration of two <coughs> United Kingdom SIs and the issue of legislative consent, and the instruments are the Law Enforcement and Security Separation Issues, etc., EU Exit Regulations, and the European Institutions and Consular Protection Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2018. I refer members to papers four and no, I refer members to papers five and six, which are notes by the clerk on each of these instruments. Um, I'll ask separately first, do members have any comments on the law enforcement and security separation issues? Regulations. No member is indicating that they have any comments. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, John, I missed you there. John Finney, please. Um, thank you, convener. I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary is still with us. Um, the committee over a period is going right back to when the UK temporarily opted out of the Lisbon Accord, had concerns about any deficiencies between the existing collaborative approach that's taken place between Scotland's police service and indeed um, prosecution service and the European Union services. I would be concerned if there are any deficiencies that have not been highlighted. I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary can comment on that, please. I'm happy to do so. None have been raised with me, but again, if the member will allow me, I'll, I'll double check with my colleagues uh, and if there are any deficiencies uh, as he articulates, then I'm more than happy to come back to the member via the committee. John Finney. Um, thank you very much, convener, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I, I wasn't aware of whether the Cabinet Secretary was to be involved at this stage, but it would be helpful to understand, given the previous work the committee has done, if there are any, any um, gaps that remain. I fear there are. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. And can I just underscore that if the Cabinet Secretary is going to come back to that, the Cabinet Secretary should come to the to the committee, uh, to the whole of the committee on that, please. Um, uh, are there any further comments on the law enforcement and security separation issues regulations from uh, members? Are there any comments uh, from members on the European Institutions and Consular Protection Amendment EU exit regulations from 2018? No member is indicating that they have any comments on uh, these regulations, and if members have no comments to make, are we agreed that the Scottish Parliament should give its consent to the Law Enforcement and Security Regulations 2020 and to the European Institutions and Consular Protection Regulations 2018? Members are content. Um, are members content to delegate to me the publication of a short factual report on our deliberations on these instruments today? Members are content with that. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, that concludes the public part of our um, meeting uh, today. Our next meeting will be a week today on Tuesday, the 22nd of September, when we will be meeting in um, hybrid format. Um, members who wish to be in the Scottish Parliament for this meeting, uh, we will be meeting uh, physically in the, in the Scottish Parliament, but we will also be uh, enabling members to uh, dial in uh, remotely if they wish, and when we will complete uh, taking evidence at stage one on the defamation and malicious publication bill uh, by hearing from uh, the responsible minister, Ash Denham. And we'll now uh, move um, into private session for the final item on our agenda, uh, which will be on Microsoft uh, Teams. Thank you very much.